Yeah, interoperability is is very good in Europe in particular. Um, less good in America. Um, it's developed over a period of decades um, and uh, largely um, is largely built based on um, a set of um, technologies that were developed a number of decades ago and have been gradually modernized. So there are two aspects to the interoperability. One is um, at, the, at the banking level where banks are interconnected via a range of switches, both national and international. And um, in recent years, um, th this comes, comes back to a point I was trying to get to earlier on. There's a lot, of, a lot of existing infrastructure in many of these countries, which is very difficult to replace. It has been um, in place for a long time, gradually modernized, built on, extra services layered on top. And most recently, of course, you have instant payment solutions that have been layered on top. So for example, in the UK, we have faster payments. So I can send money from my bank account to any other bank account in the UK, and the funds arrive instantly. Because they don't actually arrive instantly. All that happens is that it's an agreement between banks. If you get this message from, from Paul's bank, then you can pay out to your customer instantly and the money will follow along later, maybe three hours, something like that, maybe a bit later. Um, but it's about trust. And that's a perfectly good solution. Um, with regard to interoperable payments, we almost entirely rely on Visa, MasterCard, American Express, etc., who have developed a set of interoperable mechanisms which are entirely proprietary and which work very well. And because they've recruited all of the banks uh, as either Visa or MasterCard issuers, then every banked customer has a Visa or MasterCard facility, which enables, um, uh, enables these uh, interoperable payments. But of course, they're not actually very, they're actually very expensive. There's a huge amount of infrastructure in place. And the conventional way that which, in which these payment schemes work is, is not beneficial to merchants. So merchants can pay a significant proportion of their income. And in many cases, they only receive payments days or in extreme circumstances, weeks later. And uh, at any point, the payment schemes can demand that the money is reversed because of some fraud or query to the transaction, whatever it may be. It's so it doesn't really support financial inclusion from that perspective. And that actually, talk, if we're going to talk about financial inclusion in particular, we actually have a real problem with financial inclusion in Europe and America, um, in that the financial sector has essentially been developed by the prosperous middle classes with um, for the needs that they perceive. And they don't necessarily understand the needs of poorer people. So we have um, financial services where a lot of the, the, the less prosperous in society, the poorer in society, essentially opt out and use other means of managing their money, principally around cash. And I think that's, that's a very sad situation. And particularly when with modern digital banking services, we could actually fix many of those problems. Um, it's just that there isn't the momentum for them. So financial inclusion is not something that's uh, um, limited just to developing economies. It's, it's a worldwide problem in my view. Well, one of the biggest in my view is um, India in particular. India has made such a good job of, of um, developing this interoperability, providing the infrastructure, using government funds essentially to drive that interoperability, certainly in the early days. And it's been interesting as well to see how they have um, experimented with a number of uh, approaches to driving merchant payments through, through UPI and of course um, via, via the PISP model in recent, in recent years. 
it, there's, there's been a lot of good lessons to learn. One of the issues that I have with it, though, is that um, it's a very particular Indian solution. And a lot of other countries have thought, well, India has done this. Let's just copy it. And it doesn't really work like that because every country is different. Um, another country that surprisingly has done rather well in this or has laid the, laid the groundwork for being able to do rather well in this is Nigeria uh, with BVN. Um, it's just that they don't have quite the same, um, how can I put this politely, the same drive towards centralized organization uh, or the same responsiveness to central organization that India might have. And so they haven't, been a, they haven't actually been able to capitalize on a lot of the work they've done there. But we saw early success stories with BVN around social payments or, or in fact, civil service salaries were um, by tying payments into an identity, um, the, the government departments were able to drive out significant numbers of um, ghost employees, um, be they people who had actually left the civil service or people who had actually died, and similarly with pensions. Um, so they have, they have the foundations there. They just need to go maybe a little further. Um, where else? Um, there's some great work here that's happening um, across Asia, uh, particularly Southeast Asia. Huge amounts of work there um, in interoperable payments. Singapore has done extremely well. Um, I'd like to say that Kenya has done well, um, but not as well as it could do. And in Kenya, of course, the problem isn't particularly that there, there isn't the will. It's the, it's the again, the vested interests. With that. Kenya has similar problems to, um, I think, the, uh, the UK in that the banks have vested interests in a particular way of doing things and don't particularly um, invest in or highlight alternatives as you might expect, uh, protecting their existing base. I just wish there was more vision. I know that the Kenya Bankers Association, they definitely do have that vision. Um, and I know the leadership there have been extremely um, far-sighted. I just wish that there were others in the financial sector who could grasp that same vision and take some of those risks. And I think it would really benefit Kenya as a country. It's about transactions for me. Well, for, that's for, for the financial sector actors because it's about the transactions. It's about seeing um, the move, move gradually away from cash. Um, it's about um, being able to actually see that there is a benefit in um, maybe facilitating those transactions and not trying to protect the status quo not trying to keep everyone inside your own walled garden, but taking the bigger picture, seeing that a, a smaller slice of a much bigger pie is far more beneficial. And more to the point, it's beneficial to, the, to, you, to your customers, beneficial to the, to the citizens of your country and beneficial to your country as a whole. Um, to, um, to customers, to the financially underserved, the benefit is being able to fully participate in um, in the digital economy. To uh, merchants, for example, you can start to see uh, where instant payments have taken hold, where interoperability has taken hold um, in particular. You start to see, um, not necessarily in the early days, higher incomes, but you see the money coming in more quickly. You see a huge increase in liquidity in these merchants. So whereas before payments were coming in as cash or maybe in a few cases there were digital payments, but that money was being tied up in other purposes. When it's digital, you can interact with your suppliers, uh, you can interact direct or directly on the supply chain, and it frees up that money to move more quickly. And when money moves more quickly, when it's more liquid, um, the prosperity of that individual merchant improves the range of things that a small shopkeeper can keep in their shop 
increases because things as soon as things sell you can you can get something else in instantly and you can afford to stock a broader a broader range of goods which is to the benefit of the of the local economy as a whole it is hard to see anybody who and how anybody does anything other than benefit from interoperability um, it is a short-term view to think that you can operate in your walled garden and prosper. Uh, you will to some extent, but it's, there's so much more that we could all do, so much more we could all achieve, and interoperability is the key to this. I think you can split it, split it mm -hmm. off for a start. The, how you charge the connected financial service provider FSP mm. is different from how they connect, how they charge their customers. Yeah. Um, um, one thing, I, one example I give of why why charging um, per transaction is such a bad thing is what we saw in India, of course, mm. because in the in the early days, of course, merchants were being charged for transactions. Mm. Um, there, there was a fee for every individual transaction, and um, what we saw was that the merchants would refuse to pay that and they'd simply add it on to what they were charging their customers. Mm -hmm. And then the customers would see there was a surcharge for using a digital payment. So they'd say, okay, let's go with cash then. So all the charging did was essentially um, drive a return to cash. And the, the way that um, that was um, resolved and what caused the huge increase in transactions in uh, UPI is um, deciding that those transactions should all be free. It's the only way to do it, I'm afraid. You cannot copy the, the visa model and say we'll charge per transaction and merchants will happily pay because they won't. Um, when they're used to, to uh, working in a cash economy where um, uh, the cost of cash is invisible to them because it's a cost to the economy, not not a cost to the individual merchant. Then they will resort to cash, and we have to always bear in mind that cash is the ultimate interoperable technology, and that's what we're competing with. Um, so, the in that case, the model that I've been trying to build is that um, there is a charge to the merchant, a small charge every month to accept digital payments, but it's not related to the number of transactions. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fee, I, I don't know what that figure is, but it's of the order of $10, $20 per month for a merchant. And for that, they get a set of software which helps them to run their business, um, stock management, employee management, connections to suppliers, all of that in one app. Oh, and by the way, you also accept payments as a side as a side benefit. Um, I also think that you can't make that uniform across all merchants. So I think that the micro merchants, the, um, the uh, roadside merchants, ro uh, road, roadside markets, all that kind of thing, you can't charge them at all. There has to be a zero charge there. It has to be when you get to a certain volume that you, you start to incur a charge and that charge is fixed monthly. It can't be per transaction because introducing transaction charges in this context simply drives people back to cash as the supposedly free interoperable method. Uh, this brings me to a broader view on how we achieve financial inclusion, which really means capitalizing on that interoperability and the use of that switch. I'll return to the question of the business case in a moment. But first, we have a tendency to focus on individual use cases. So it might be um, uh, loan disbursements, it might be merchant payments, it might be loan repayments, it might be um, social payments or schools, school uh, fees, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and I like to say that we should always remember that people aren't use cases, and we have to understand how they live in their financial ecosystem. So we have to stand in their shoes and look to see how they use money, how they use financial services, and we have to have an answer to every 
aspect of that um, ecosystem, if you like, if we are going to encourage people to move towards that digital economy to the use of the financial services, in, um, by which I mean, of course, interoperable financial services. If there is a significant, a large part of their personal ecosystem which isn't included in this interoperable ecosystem, then they will revert to cash. And once they revert to cash for that significant element of their ecosystem, they will revert to cash for everything. So we need to take that 360 view of the personal financial ecosystem. On the business case, um, I think that there's a lot to be said that the FSPs need to be absorbing a lot of the cost here. We can't expect the end customers to, um, to absorb those costs. Um, I, as a um, customer of numerous banks in the UK, I pay nothing for financial services. Um, I get my debit cards for free. I get my banking services for free. If that can be done here, why can't that be done in um, Bangladesh? Why can't it be done in Nigeria? Why can't it be done in Kenya? And the answer, is, of course, is it can. It's about how the financial service providers make, make money in other areas. And before any listeners uh, to this um, uh, video think to themselves, well, you're not charging them merchant fees, I know by looking at the balance books that none of the banks in the UK make significant money out of payments at all. Um, I think you've put your finger on it. There needs to be support from somewhere for the development of that infrastructure, which is where a lot of the cost comes from in, in the early days. And a lot of the fees that these switches need to charge over the early years are related to paying off the costs of, um, of deployment and integration. Um, and help from um, governments, from um, other agencies, will help to avoid those costs being passed on. I mean, across uh, America, you know, Europe, we have the advantage that those costs have been essentially um, dispersed across multiple decades, way back to 1950s, for example. So uh, though we're talking almost 70 years, the costs have already been um, split up. So we don't have to worry about them anymore. There, there's some costs. Trying instead to come to a situation where you're building the first switch to integrate banks and uh, MFIs, um, where you're incurring all that cost in one go, is uh, going to result in a switch which is financially non-viable. We have to have a mechanism through which we can um, get support for the development of those switches to bring everyone up to essentially the level playing field. Um, afterwards, operational costs. Well, operational costs of a well-run modern switch are actually pretty low. And we should also be uh, addressing this issue that we have from so many regulators where they don't want um, infrastructure in the cloud. In the cloud is vastly cheaper in terms of the development of, of an interoperable payment switch. I mean, a couple of orders of magnitude cheaper. So we have to address their reasonable concerns, but also challenge when regulators are saying um, cloud is no, because there are very, very good measures in place to make sure that they can um, manage those services in the cloud that they don't lose any control or influence and they don't and the citizens of the country don't lose um, control of their own data these issues are well understood now um, and i really don't think that there is a valid technological reason to say you cannot operate a a, a modern switch in the cloud particularly given the fact that it is so much cheaper to do so um, to say that that um, the regulator wouldn't have access to their citizens' data is no longer true. We know how to do that. Um, to say that other people would have access, no, nope, we, can, we can manage all of that. Um, and to say that you want to stay with these 
uh, perhaps 20th century views of how things are done is to deny your country that development opportunity. You could do local crowd, but remember that that's just a compromise of the same the same mm -hmm. ideas. Um, the problem with doing anything with doing um, uh, on prem, as we call it, on premises deployments, is that mm -hmm. to get the robustness robustness that you need to develop mm -hmm. a a piece of critical infrastructure like an interoperable payment system, you have mm -hmm. to have three world class data centers interconnected in real time. So they have to be you know, less than 100 kilometers apart, for example. That's three massively expensive data centers. You can't have two because um, you have to be operating all three at the same time in order to get the robustness of transactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if, um, if you only have two, how do you know which one is right when, it, when a dispute comes up? Um, if you have three, then two can outvote one. So you have to have three. Um, and that's a huge amount of cost. Um, but if I want to deploy a, um, a switch in the cloud, which takes advantage of, of existing distributed infrastructure, I can get that up and running within hours. And I do not have to have that upfront, upfront expenditure of tens of millions of dollars to build three world-class data centers. Um, the business case is unarguable because that those tens of millions of dollars have to be re repaid somehow. And then it comes down to the business case for the switch itself. So it's essentially um, runs the risk of the switch being um, essentially uneconomic from day one. So given the lack of sunk expenditure in infrastructure, the lack of data centers, um, I personally don't think that there is any justification for using an, an on-prem solution if you're coming at this from scratch. Cloud is the, by far the most sensible way to go.